And thank you, uh, for Jeanette Touvan, for having me here. And thanks, thanks to all of you for showing up today. I'm sure you had more interesting things to do today. Um, and uh, I'm really happy to be here and talk to you about this new and uh, unusual animal called the Canada's anti-spam legislation, or CASEL. Um, not the most sexy uh, title, for sure, but um, something that, as you will find out, all of you and everybody <coughs> should know about. And so I hope that I can give you some insight into what this is all about, what you need to know. And after me, there'll be Jim uh, Freer from um, MethodWorks, and he will give you what you need to do to uh, comply with CASEL. So hopefully between the two of us, you will leave here a little bit more, with a little more knowledge, or I hope much more knowledge about uh, what to expect before July, what you should do before July 1st, 2014. And just before, actually, before I go ahead, we anticipate that you will have questions. Um, we are here to answer, hopefully, most of the questions what, in the time that we have. However, um, I ask that if you can leave your questions to the end of the presentation, and certainly I will try or do our best to answer um, to answer your questions and whatever we don't get done today I'm happy to answer after. <clears throat> so what I'll be talking about um, is basically four topics. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an overview of Castle. What is it? I'll then talk about the most I guess significant portion of Castle which is the commercial electronic messages part which I think, or I believe, most of you are here today to, to, to hear about. Um, I will give you some tips for preparing for CASEL, uh, particularly for charities and nonprofits. And then I'll give you a brief overview of the other parts of CASEL, the non-CEM sections. Okay. So, what is CASEL? Well, you can see the problem. Um, Canada has been known, well, until July 1st, 2014, will be known as the spammer hacker haven in the world. They, you know, all the spammers love Canada because we did not have any legislation to deal with spam, to deal with hackers. Um, and uh, as part of our G20 commitments, we agreed to do something about it. And because we were known as the haven, um, some people up in Ottawa got together and decided to take a big stand on it, I guess, and go the opposite, exact opposite way. And what we, I would say, is probably, as of July 1st, 2014, going to be the one of the most harshest spam legislations in the world, if not the most. So, I, the reason I chose this uh, cartoon or the caricature is because Castle is all about figuring out what is spam and what isn't spam and dealing with it. Except what they did, at least in my view, is they've taken what we believe traditionally is spam and said, uh-uh, that's not enough. We're going to apply it to everybody. Okay, basically all elect commercial electronic messages. So the solution, what have they done? Castle regulates a broad range of electronic online activities. The reason it does that, as I mentioned, is that they decided that in, instead of trying to figure out what is really spam and you know going after that prince, that Nigerian prince asking for your money down and you know send some money down to Africa, they're just going to go after everybody, all basically um, unsolicited electronic messages, and uh, make sure that everybody complies with these. Okay, um, so that's the main part of it. As I mentioned, it will be dealing with commercial electronic messages, which is what I'll discuss shortly. Um, there are other parts of the castle. The other parts deal with the installation of computer programs. I, I'll deal with that briefly at the end. Um, misleading advertising and marketing practices. That's another section of castle. Um, that's um, <clears throat> something that is already out there under other legislation. Castle deals with misleading marketing and advertising online. Um, it regulates privacy invasion uh, through your computer, uh, much more than what you would just, what you assume would be 
privacy invasion that they goes after email harvesting. I mentioned that as well, um, and uh, basically anything that you can think of that's out there that's gathering your information um, without your knowledge. So, what do they do? Um, I'll talk about the legislation, but as of July 1st, 2014, they created a website, they being the government, um, fightspamgc.ca. Anyone who believes that they have uh, received an but for example, an electronic message that is in, not in compliance with Castle can go and file a complaint on that at that website. That website is managed by the CRTC. Little anecdote: uh, when they were planning all this, how do we how are we going to figure out how are we going to deal with complaints? What are we going to do about a website? They apparently um, the government had um, put out a bid, you know, asked people to bid for managing this website private in the private sector. No one bid on it. <laughs> no one wanted to deal with this. With this, it's going to be a big headache. So they didn't want to. Deal. So the CRTC is managing it on its own. How are they going to do? Well, we'll have to see in a couple months. All right. So the fundamental underlying principles of Castle. Well, when you think about Castle, you got to think about uh, I guess two major rules. The first rule is whatever the regulated activity is, and we'll talk about what the regulated activity is. There's got to be consent for it, okay? And not only consent, but informed consent. It's an opt-in regime. While most of the world deals with opt-out regimes, you know, you can send it until someone says, don't send it to me, not, uh -uh, not in Canada. As of July 1st, 2014, you cannot send it without having already obtained consent. And not only just any consent, but informed consent. The person has to know what they're consenting to. The other part of Castle's requirements Various, in various elements of Castle's requirements, again, I'll deal with those elements, is that whoever is um, putting out the email, whoever is doing the activity, has to properly identify themselves. So the person on the receiving end of that activity and that electronic activity has to know who they're dealing with. It can't be appear as if it's by, by someone else. Okay, well... I think one of the reasons I, I believe most of you are here, because you have probably heard somewhere, but how significant it would be for uh, to be caught with uh, not not complying with Castle, and it really is. Um, I'm guess I'm you know here to say you know the 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 harsh truth, and the harsh truth is <laughs> they have imposed very significant fines, and this is regulatory fines as of J July 1st, 2014. Um, Fines up to one million dollars per individual per email. Um, fines up to ten million dollars per corporation. Corporation being nonprofits as well per email. There, uh, I'll, I'll deal with the private rights of action for a minute. But just as of July first, two thousand and fourteen, um, those fines are what CRTC likes to refer to as administrative monetary penalties. They say it's not a fine. Um, could be extended to uh, directors and officers. So, your board of directors, your charity, or a nonprofit, they are face. They would face personal liability for any act of the organization, as well as the corporation itself can face liability for those fines um, for one email sent by one of their employees. Okay, so it's really sweeping um, regulatory, uh, very you know significant. Um, Consequences. In addition, as of July 1st, 2017, there will be private, right, private rights of action. Anyone can sue in court um, for a violation of Castle. Um, and that, as you can, well, as, as a lawyer, as a litigator, I can just imagine and I know what's going on out there. The class actions, those, the, the plaintiff lawyer side class actions are just you know, biding their time, waiting for July 1st, 2017, to sign up anyone who received an email that's not in compliance with CASEL. <clears throat> and we're talking million millions of dollars in civil liability. Um, you know, and the actual act allows for up to a million dollars per individual per, per day in damages. So. so you're basically talking about the equivalent of ambulance chasing yeah. for email for emails. Yeah, pretty much. Um, that comes in July 1st, 2017. So we have a little more time to deal with the civil side of things, but as of July 1st, 2014, the government, being the CRTC, can go after you for the fines. 
Um, I also mentioned at the bottom a little, there, they, the Act also provides the government, as well as the plaintiffs, as once they start an action, with sweeping investigative powers. So search and, search and seizure orders. They can come in and ask for their computers and go through your computers to find any if they're trying to figure out who sent what. Okay, so very uh, significant uh, intrusions. Okay, so I mentioned a couple dates. There are actually three dates uh, that are important to know about Castle. The first, as I mentioned, July 1st, 2014, only a few months from now. That's when the requirements regarding CEMs comes into force, the commercial electronic messages, what we'll be talking about most of the, um, <clears throat> most of the session today. July 1st, 2015, sorry, January 1st, 2015, so that's about uh, six, seven months, eight months uh, away from now. The requirements regarding computer programs will be coming into force. I'll talk about that at the end of the session today. And I mentioned as well, July 1st, 2017, that's when the private rights of action, that's when anyone can sue. As well as, and this is important for charities and nonprofits, that's the end of the transition period for implied consent. I will talk about that, but I just want to give you an idea of the important dates. So you've got to think about July 1st, 2014, July 1st, 2017, and January 1st, 2015. Those are the major dates. Okay, so CASEL is really a complicated regulatory regime. As I mentioned, it deals with all kinds of activities online. And <laughs> so in addition to having many aspects to it, there's also three regulated bodies. And they have sort of intertwining powers, and they can deal with each other, and it just gives them way more power, basically. So um, the main body that will be regulating, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is the CRTC. It will be dealing with regulating the CEM part and the installation of computer programs. So they're going to be the ones who uh, will be receiving complaints when someone receives an, an email, or sorry, sorry, someone sends an email uh, that is not in compliance with CASEL, and they'll be knocking on that door. The Privacy Commissioner will, uh, is tasked with dealing with the collection of private information online and address harvesting. And the Comp Competition Bureau is um, charged with uh, misleading online advertising and marketing. However, as I mentioned, they, the way the, um, the regulations and legislation is set up right now is that they, these uh, bodies can talk to each other and give each other information. It's kind of um, quite, uh, quite large in, in how a government will be dealing with this. All right. So, that was the overview, basically. Um, I'm here, the base, we're going to be talking about what I think everybody is here to hear about, and that's the commercial electronic messages. Uh, what is a commercial electronic message? So I mentioned, it's not what you think is spam. We think of spam as something sent by a Nigerian prince asking for money or, you know, uh, trying to sell you uh, some physically enhancing drugs, etc. That's not what we're dealing with here. We are dealing with um, a, a message sent by any electronic means. So anything, emails, texts, tweets, anything electronic that has as, as its purpose or one of its purposes to encourage participation in commercial activity. That's the definition the Act has for a commercial electronic message. Okay. So. As a lawyer, I say, well, what is commercial activity? You know, we're, we're encouraging. You have to have only one purpose to encourage a commercial activity. Well, what is that? Well, <clears throat> the Act has defined commercial activity in a very broad manner. And it, it is any particular transaction, act, or conduct that is of a commercial character, whether or not the person who carries it out does so in the expectation of profit. And those words, and I've, I've highlighted those, are why all of you are here today. That means, and, and the CRTC has said, said that, and Industry Canada has said that, that means it applies to any activity done by a nonprofit in a charity. Because it's not necessarily for profit. It's basically any activity that you do, and then you're carrying on the business of the charity or the nonprofit. So, do charities and NPOs transmit CMs? Yes. The answer is yes. No question. Okay, examples of some of what would be uh, considered a CM under the Act: emails asking for donations, emails seeking volunteers or members, emails selling tickets, emails promoting services, emails um, promoting an event, 
electronic newsletters, email promoting the organization charity. Basically everything. <laughs> okay. I, ex, you know, the only thing I would say that sort of ex, that maybe would be part of a charity and nonprofit emails or communication that it wouldn't fall under it would be something that would be purely informative. But it, if it's not if it's not going to be a CM, there has to be it has to be entirely informative, and there cannot be any thing in the email that would suggest a promotion of the activity of the organization. So a newsletter that says, here's all the great things we do, we're great, we do all this great stuff, blah, blah, blah. Find out more about us, please click here. That turns it into a CEO. Okay. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. All right. I know I said questions at the end, but I know everybody, this is the one everybody wants. This is go my ahead. second one. I have, I'll, we'll go back to the other one later. <laughs> yeah. Some charities, uh, I understand, believe that they're exempt because there was some kind of exemptions. Yeah. I, as I said, that's why I said, let's wait for questions. Talk I, will, I will talk about the exemptions. Okay. Absolutely. I'll wait. All right. And so let's, you know, why don't we wait for questions to the end? That's for the exact reason that I probably will answer your question before you even, you know, before we get there. Okay. Oh, so. Um, what are the general requirements regarding CFs? Well, as I mentioned, this is an opt-in regime. What does that mean? It means that you are prohibited from sending a CM to an electronic address unless the receiver of that CM has already consented to receiving it. Okay? And that CM contains specific information, and we'll get to what information it has to contain. Okay? And I added subject to limited exclusions and exemptions. I'll talk about the charity exemption shortly. However, that's the general requirement. So all CMs cannot, you cannot send, you, well, basically, any CM cannot be sent without first receiving consent and two, including particular information. <clears throat> now, the consent requirements, that's the first requirement. Well, there's two types of consent. You can have express consent or you can have implied consent. Okay? The Act allows you to have either or. Okay. However, very important, the Act says that the onus of proving consent is on the sender. So if you send out a CM, someone receives it, they go to the CRTC and they complain and say, I never consented to this. Then the CRTC calls you and says, well, what's going on? Sends you a notice as, you know, prove consent. You have to be able to prove it. Okay. It's not that they have to say, they have to show that they haven't consented. No, no, you have to show that they have consented. Okay. And therein lies where data collection is important, which Jim will deal with shortly. One more kicker. It's very important. The Act says that an electronic message seeking yeah. consent is a CEM and is therefore prohibited. So you cannot, as of July 1st, 2014, let's not forget that's when it comes into force, and as of July 1st, 2014, you cannot send someone an electron, an email and say, can you consent to, will you cons give me consent to receiving CMs? That will be a CM. So, yeah. <laughs> Confusing? Problematic? It certainly is. <clears throat> so, I mentioned the first request, the first requirement is that you have to have consent. That consent can be expressed or it can be implied. Well, I'm going to deal with what is express consent. Well, the Act says very specific requirements, or has specific requirements regarding what, what is express consent. How do you seek express consent? Okay. So, first thing that you can do is you can get express consent. Express is something that someone says, I consent. It can be done orally. It can be done in writing. Okay. Now, the problem with someone telling you, I, I agree, like me coming to you and saying, send me, send me your electronic messages, send me news as well. Go ahead and I, I'll, you know, two months from now, I forget. How do you prove that? that, therefore, in writing is always better. Um, the request for consent has to be also very specific. Okay? You can't just say, you consent, you know, will you consent to X? It has to be specific. So you have to, first of all, tell the person what they're consenting to. Okay? And it has to be stated clearly and simply. All right? They have to understand. That's what I said in the beginning. It, it's all about informed consent. You can't trick them into consenting. They have to understand what they're consenting to. We're consenting, you know, they're consenting to receiving newsletters from you. They're consenting to receive uh, any form of electronic communications. But they have to understand that, okay? 
Um, when you're seeking consent, you have to make sure you identify who you're seeking consent for. So, if you're seeking consent on, on behalf of an organization, you have to identify that organization. If you're seeking consent on behalf of an organ another organization, or, for example, you intend to sell your list to someone else and you want that person to use it, you have to tell them that that's going to be done. They have to consent to that as well. And you have to say that at any time the person consenting can withdraw the consent. So you have to say, you know, you know, you click here by clicking here, you're here by consent to for me sending you electronic messages. Um, you may withdraw that consent at any time, but you have to say that. Otherwise, it doesn't comply with the express consent requirements of the app. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So that's express consent. Well, what is implied consent? Implied consent is when someone actually doesn't tell you they consent. But you imply consent based on your relationship with that person or some form of a history. However, the act is very specific. Unlike in um, privacy legislation or other forms of legislation where implied consent is more broadly applied, it's kind of just understood or can, can be interpreted based on the history or historical relationship, the act lists specifically what constitute implied consent. If it doesn't fall under one of those specific characteristics, it doesn't account for implied consent. So you have to meet those definitions or those requirements. So I'm going it, to, there's a few of them and I'm going to, these are, I'll give a few examples. So the first example would be when the person you are sending your CEM to has conspicuously published his or her electronic message, uh, sorry, electronic um, address. So for example, they have a, a website bio. I have a website bio. I have my email there. So I put my email there. You know my email. Um, two, I have the person has not indicated a desire to not receive unsolicited CMs. So I haven't said, please don't send me CMs. It's kind of like when you put on a, a, a note on your mailbox that says no, uh, no solicited email. Same idea. Um, and the message is relevant to the recipient's, recipient's business role, duties, or function. So I'm a lawyer, and I have my bio on my website. And my email's there, and it doesn't say don't send me CMs. You can send me CMs, but it's going to be relevant to what I do, based on that implied consent. If it's not, you can't do that. You can't, it doesn't meet this definition. Okay. So it's got to be based, you know, on, you know, you're, you're trying to sell me a service that lawyers need. Okay. Um, another example of an implied consent. Well, the recipient, recipient has disclosed his or her electronic address to you. You're the sender without indicating a wish not to receive an unsolicited CEM. So, for example, I gave you my business card. Here's my business card. That's the start. I have this, and on my business card is my email address. And the message, again, is relevant to the recipient's business role uh, and official capacity. So, once again, I gave you my business card. You want to sell me a service. You can contact me and send me a service. You do that. I give you implied consent to do that. Okay, but it has to be related to my business as a lawyer. Yes? Well, there is, and that's another part of this, and I'm going to get to that. But for these implied consent, there isn't, a, there isn't a time frame. So this example, but again, this is very specific. It's only when the CM is relevant to the person receiving it, their duty or function. You can't, just, you know, if it's not relevant to what they do, then it's not, it, there's no implied consent. So you're a charity, or you're a, you're a nonprofit, and you're sending some information to that individual about your what you're doing, great stuff, all, all fine, but the person, it's not really part of their, it's just you're trying to get some donations or whatever it is. Um, that might not meet this definition of the pie consent. Okay. Now, you mentioned a time frame. So, another form of implied consent, which I expect most charities and nonprofits will rely on, is what is called the non-business relationship. This is one of the major um, components of the castle that, that if you're in, in the charity, the nonprofit sector, I believe you will be using to send your CEM. So, the act says that anyone has implied consent, well, sorry, any charity or registered charity has implied consent to send CEMs to their donors or their volunteers that have donated or volunteered in the preceding two years. So, for the moment someone donates to you, is it your registered charity? Has to be a registered charity, and you have received a donation. At that point, you have two years implied consent to send them CMs. If you are a registered cha a registered charity, someone volunteered, you've got two years. The moment those two years are over, you do not no longer have implied consent. And that 
that's from the date that they made that deposit yeah, right. or whatever they Right. Now, if they do it every year, the yeah, two years starts again. Okay. Um, if you are a nonprofit organization, this is really the only specific, I guess, um, unique character of SASL for nonprofits. Okay. So if you're a nonprofit, not a registered charity, but a nonprofit, as nonprofits are um, identified under the Income Tax Act, um, that nonprofit will have two years to send CMs to their members. But those members have to be members for two years. So, if someone has joined you for two years and you know it's not a regular uh, like yearly membership, they've you know they and then a year later they haven't renewed their membership. After another year, you're done. So you've got two years from the moment they joined you. Okay. Um, the other implied consent is what is called the existing business relationship. This is the kind of uh, uh, implied consent that organizations such as charities and uh, nonprofits rely on for uh, sending CMs to uh, other businesses with whom they do they do business with, so suppliers, um, sponsors, etc. Uh, so this is similar to the uh, to the non-business relationship in the sense that there's a two-year time frame. Okay, if you have implied consent to send a CEM to someone if they have purchased, leased, bartered a product, good service, and land from you. Okay, so there's some kind of a uh, transaction that happened. Um, they've accepted the business investment or gaming opportunity. So again, if they've uh, sponsored you and for something, um, or a written contract is, is created between you. So as long as there's some kind of a business uh, relationship existing for two years, you're good. But after two years, again, that to that clock ends. No more. You can't send any. Uh, you have to get a, a, another form of consent. Um, and then contract is still important. Uh, yeah. <coughs> well, yeah, written contract is created. Yes, absolutely. So you got you enter into a contract. The contract can be enforced, but it's only two years. Okay. Um, and uh, and then the other option is, is for example, you have an interim contract or you haven't sold anything to them, but they have uh, approached you with an inquiry and there was some negotiation in the past six months. You have a six months period for not someone that doesn't ha hasn't actually entered into a transaction, but has began some kind of communication to do that. So they inquired, they applied, that's only six months. Okay. Now, with regard to that two-year period for the non-business, in other words, the members, donors, and volunteers, Okay. As well as the business relationship, so the uh, transaction, there is an extension. There is a bit of a reprieve, uh, which, which, uh, in the beginning, when once July first comes in, once we pass July first, basically the the act gives you a three year transition uh, period. So you have until July first, two thousand and seventeen, to extend. That, well, that implied consent is extended to July first, two thousand and seventeen. So they've given you a bit of a, a leeway, another extra year at the beginning because they realize that people are going to need to kind of get used to this, All right? But that's only with respect to the implied consent. It doesn't mean you have three years for everybody. You just have three years um, to, of implied consent for if you're a registered charity with, your, with respect to your donors and your volunteers, and you have three years of implied consent if you're an, an NPO with respect to your members. Okay, that gives you a bit of a time, a little bit more time. Okay, so... Mm. I'm going to go on to the information requirements for CMs. So, but you know, you know, the consent thing the, <coughs> is a big issue. So, perhaps maybe I'll take a couple questions on consent, and then uh, we'll move on to the information requirements. Yeah. Just to clarify, express consent does it have any time period in terms of how long that lasts? For no. If you get express consent, it's indefinite, okay. unless they, they withdraw. Right. And we'll talk about the unsubscribe. Yes. So. Does it have to be a physical opt-in, or if there's just a message? For example, say a login is required, and it just says by logging in, you agree to receive marketing material. No, well. it has to be expressed on there. In fact, I'll get to that a little later, but you can't even have a pre-check box. I'm going to talk about what the actual physically. No pre-check boxes. 
Jim will deal with that as well, I believe, right, Jim? Yeah, no pre check boxes. That's one of the CRTC, um, the, the Act doesn't talk about that. In fact, that's more of a CRTC thing. They, you know, for some reason, they got it into their heads that pre check boxes are bad. And so they're going around telling everybody they're not going to, not, they don't like pre check boxes. What if the boss is into and says, if you like to receive yeah. those letters, that's okay. That's fine. Do. As long as you, as long as they have to do a physical act of consenting. You cannot, you can, and you cannot tag it along also on something else. It has to be separate and apart. So you can't say, you know, you hereby agree in another privacy legislation. You hereby agree uh, that we share, you know, your private, you know, collect your private information for our purposes and share it for, you know, whatever it is, and et cetera, et cetera. Everybody has their language and that's fine. Um, that cannot be, you can't use that for Castle. You have to have a separate section for Castle where the consent specifically for the receipt of commercial electronic messages. It has to be separate. Okay, sorry. Um, well, I'm going to let someone in the back. I'll get to other questions again, but before I go ahead, one more question on consent only because we have a, we don't have a lot of time, and we will get to it. Yes? Sorry, sorry. sorry. Existing business or non-business? Uh, business relationship? No. Existing business relationship applies to everybody across the board. Okay. The non-business, the existing non-business relationship is specific to NPOs, charities, and charities. Okay. That's the charities, donors, and volunteers, NPOs, members. That's a non-business relationship. The business relationship is a separate implied consent that applies to anyone, anyone in the business community, for example. I mean, I'm, I mean we rely on it a lot. All right. I'm going to go ahead and, and we'll get, there'll be more questions, I'm sure, at the end, and we'll, I will deal with it, I promise. <laughs> All right, so I mentioned two requirements for CMs. First one is consent. Second one is information requirements, okay? There has to be specific details and information in each and every CM. It doesn't, if it doesn't include that information, it doesn't comply with the app, okay? So all CMs must include identifying and contact information of the sender, or the person or organization on whom they have the CEM is being sent. So you got to have their address. They have, and it's specific. There's a specific list of what's got to be there. It's got to be their address. There has to be a, a, a telephone number or an email. There's got to be um, uh, and the name, of course, the name of the person, the name of the organization. And if you're sending it on behalf of someone else, you have to identify that. Um, there has to be a means by which to contact the sender, which is effective for at least 60 days. So what does that mean? It means that the email or the phone number within that, within the CM has to be, someone can be able to contact you at that address or at that phone number for at least 60 days. What happens if that email goes, uh, you know, something goes wrong in the emails, whatever, you got, you got to change your email, there's a virus, etc., etc. We don't know. Hopefully, you'll get a reprieve. But... You have to ensure that, that at least there's some way of contacting you for at least 60 days. Okay. And just hitting reply will not suffice? Or yeah, that's fine. But it has to be... There, a workable email. Either. There has to be something where they can contact you for 60 days. The reason they did that is, again, you got to think about the spammers out there. They're sending out spam from wherever they are, and, you know, you try to contact them, and they can't find them. They're gone, right? So they're trying to deal with that. But, again, that, that means they're dealing with everybody. Everybody has to deal with it. Um, and then most importantly, I, mean, I say most importantly, it's just the most cumbersome part of it, is the unsubscribe mechanism. I'll talk about in a minute what the unsubscribe mechanism has its own requirements, um, and Jim will get into that. But you have to have give the person an opportunity to unsubscribe from future CMs in each CM. Okay? Now, when it's not practical for you, for example, it's too costly, to include in the CM all of these requirements, including the unsubscribe, um, you have to have all this on a website, okay? You have to have a website that includes all this information. It has an unsubscribe capabilities. And then you have to pro provide a link to that website in the CM. So, for example, you don't want to have to uh, start uh, incorporating unsubscribes into your emails. Um, and so you just instead create a website where everybody, can, someone can go down and subscribe. That link to that website has to be conspicuous in the email and it has to say to unsubscribe, click here. Stuff. Okay, so unsubscribe mechanism. There are specific requirements about it. First of all, it's got to be effective for 60 days. So the person, after within 60 days after the time that that email is sent, may be able to unsubscribe. You have to let them do that. 
and it has to be given effect within 10 days. So in that, within the 10 days of when it's sent, you have to make sure that they can unsubscribe. You can't just sit around and wait. And it has to be at no cost. Some people say, you know, charge. There's, there's some website that will charge people for unsubscribe. Really? You can't, yeah. And so uh, you cannot do that. Those are the essential requirements of unsubscribe. So, I'm going to get the exemptions, but those are, you know, before I deal with specifically with the exemptions, those are the general requirements regarding, for everybody regarding CMs, you know, both the consent and the information. Okay, now, what they've done is they've made this general requirement for everyone, and then they've carved out very specific exemptions, and those exemptions are very limited and narrow. So, when everybody's, everybody I speak to, I say, don't assume that one of, or all of these exemptions apply to you because that's not the case. It's very unlikely that um, you will be exempted from, for each and every one of your CMs, no matter who you are. Okay. So, I'm starting with the registered charities exemption because that's probably what most people here will be trying to figure out whether or not it applies to them if you're, if you're a registered charity. And so what they've done is they've given some charity, the charities a little bit of a reprieve, and I'm saying a little. They could have given them a big reprieve, but they didn't, okay? What they've said is if you're a registered charity, so you have, first of all, you have to be registered under the ITA, you are exempted from the CM requirements only if the CMs are sent, um, sorry, the message in the CM has as its primary <coughs> purpose raising funds for the charity. Okay. Emphasis is on primary purpose, all right? The wording that was selected by the by Industry Canada was wording that was specific. They could have used other kinds. They could have been very narrow. Sorry, it could have been as narrow and as broad as they wanted to, it to be. They could have made it for the purpose of raising funds. Could have made uh, all registered. They could have said all registered charities, you know, all CM sent by registered charity are exempt. They didn't do that. All right. And the difference. The, the important part is is that the definition of a CM deals with there has to be at least one purpose to uh, promote uh, participation or commercial activity. Okay. In order to be exempt from the CM requirement as a registered charity, you have to have as your primary purpose raising funds for the charity. So what does that mean? Well, the main reason for sending this message, sorry, this, um, this email has to be to raise funds. But if you're a registered charity, you're sending out a newsletter, your real purpose is to raise funds. But the person who's reading that doesn't necessarily understand because it doesn't say, please give me my, your money. Okay. It's my, now again, we, I, I, this is my interpretation of a legislation. I'm going to tell you now, no one really knows how it's going to be interpreted because it hasn't yet been applied and the, and when once eventually when it goes to court, it might be made as narrow, as broad as possible. But my interpretation of the use of primary purpose means unless it's right up front, unless you're asking for the money right up front, it's not exempt. Okay? So I gave some examples that I think will, uh, will meet the exemptions as opposed to ones that won't meet the exemption. Okay? So an email that provides information about the charity's work and contains one sentence at the bottom asking for donations or saying, to support us, please go here, that's likely not going to be considered um, exempt. However, emails that sell tickets to a charitable event, you buy this, you know, you get, you know, or come to our, you know, buy these tickets to, the, or this lottery ticket, because, you know, obviously it's, whoever reads this knows that it's going to raise funds for the charity, that's likely exempt. Okay. So you, you got to understand that. What does that mean? Well, that means that, <coughs> it means that not all of a registered charity CM will be exempt. It's most likely that you will be sending CMs if you're a registered charity that are not exempt. Some of them will be, guaranteed, because frankly, if you're, gonna, if you're trying to raise funds and you're a registered charity, you're sending out emails and you're asking for money, but if, you, you know, you, if, you, if you're applying what norm, most charities do, you don't ask for it right up front, because you're likely not going to get it. Sometimes you will, but often you won't. So, You've got to think about how far you want to go in relying on that exemption. Now, I've added another section about what 
the wording of that exemption says and um, what we're not sure about. And I'm saying we being the you know, anyone out there right now reading this legislation and regulation and trying to figure out what the CRTC means by it, well, how the CRTC will apply it. Um, it uses the words raising funds for the charity. Well, one of the questions that came up, certainly we've asked the CRTC is, um, is that different from fundraising, as that word is used in the uh, Income Tax Act, right? Because fundraising, if you're a charity, you would know that it's very specifically applied in terms of figuring out uh, what would be considered, uh, you know, fundraising for tax purposes as opposed to not tax purposes. And it's very narrowly defined by Canada Revenue Agency. Well, they didn't say fundraising in the, in the exemption under the castle. They said raising funds. So the question, is it the same? Is it different? The answer is we don't know. <laughs> um, it might be the same as fundraising. It might not be. Frankly, I don't think it matters. I think, and this is my opinion, is the CRTC is likely to focus less on the intended use of the funds, what you're going to be doing with those funds that you're asking for, and more about the content of the message you're sending. It's about the words. It's not about the use of the funds. Okay, so that's my theory. I don't know if that's the case again because no one knows. The, the, the legislation hasn't been applied and the CRTC has given us zero guidance. We've asked for it and we might get it, but so far there's been zero guidance. Um, but my understanding, just based on what I've, you know, uh, you know, dealing with the CRTC and reading their information bulletins regarding others, other, other types of exemptions, my understanding is, is that they're really going to look at what the message, the, what, the, what the email sends, says, okay? The email says, again, as, I, as an example, here's all the great stuff we're doing, we've done such good work, etc., etc. So, you know, if you want to support us, you want to find out more, go here they're likely not going to find that as not being um, exempt under legislation. If the email is right out there asking for money, they'll probably find it as exempt. Okay. Uh, so that's this charity exemption. Bottom line of the charity exemption is, as I said, and I'm going to say it again, do not assume that all CMs sent by charities are exempt because that is likely not the case. There are other exemptions that a charity or no NPO can rely on. And by the way, only applies to registered charities. The, that exemption does not apply to nonprofits. Nonprofits that are not registered charities cannot rely on that exemption. Okay. So there's other exemptions that some of you, all of you, might apply fall under. The first one is personal family relationship. Personal and family, I put them in quotations, because those are also very narrowly defined in the legislation. Apparently, <coughs> if it's a sister or a brother, it's okay, but if it's a second cousin, it's not a family relationship. <laughs> That's what the CRTC says. However, they said that it potentially could be a personal relationship if it's a second cousin, but not necessarily a family. <laughs> However, a personal relationship requires two-way, history of two-way communication. So if it's a second cousin that you haven't spoken to in many years, you can't rely on that exemption. That's an example of how this is going to be applied. Um, also, if you're friends with someone on Facebook, that doesn't mean that it's a personal relationship. That's, again, something the CRTC has said, so keep that in mind. Um, uh, true, but that's implied consent. That's not an exemption. You, have, you may have had consent from them, but you also may not, because it also has to do with their, that, that applies only when you send them an email regarding their own uh, their role in their business. So, could be other exemptions, but frankly, friends, of, I'm just quoting what the CRTC said, if someone follows you on Twitter, or if someone befriends you on Facebook, it doesn't mean that you have a personal relationship under the Act. These ones are just for registered charities? No, this is for everybody. Okay. This is, everybody can, can rely on these. Okay, that's something. I'm saying. Other CN, the registered charity one is very specific and only applies to registered charities. This is one that anyone can rely on. What? If it meets this definition. Yes. What if we're talking LinkedIn, where that there's an express business-to-business -business relationship instead of Facebook? That doesn't change anything? No. Not with respect to personal family. It doesn't consider, it's not considered a personal relationship. Well, but what, what about in terms of the, 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 uh, the, uh, the consent that you were talking about uh, before this? The, the business, existing business relationship? Uh, yes, that, that's right. But, Let's say you haven't done business with them, but they've made a business connection to you. That I, I just raise it right now because you're talking in social right. media. Um, we will. I will talk about social media um, separately, and, I'll, and for a minute, 
if you're sending an, an email, or a, actually even if through LinkedIn, you know how you can send a message that will go to someone's email? Not exactly. No, not exactly. If you're contacting them through LinkedIn, um, and I, I will talk about the, it's, um, actually it's on the next, it's in the next uh, slide. There's a, if you contact through a, a, a kind of a closed, um, I forgot what they, they call it, the framework. I'll, I'll get to it in a minute. There is a way of, if it's internal, but if it's external, that, that is exempt. But if it's external, like for example, you send an email to someone through LinkedIn, not exempt. Not exempt. Yes, I know. If, if you have conversations on social media with somebody, does that count as a two, group of a two-way personal relationship? Not a personal relationship. Okay. No. Again, what am I? What, actually, I shouldn't say it's not. It depends on the relationship. The, the CRTC has said it's very circumstantial. In other words, very, it's based on the circumstances. Well, maybe you have been emailing back and forth for a long time, and you guys are friends electronically. Maybe, but it's it's going to be on a on a. It's not a just general exemption. Like there has it's going to be on a um, case by case scenario. They're going to sort of they're going to consider it by case by case. Yeah. Other governments. I don't know. We'll see. You mean other governments externally, out of Canada, outside of Canada? The US, the US uh, yeah, they're right. definitely enforcing, but they don't have this kind of <laughs> legislation. The U.S., as like most other governments, has an opt-out legislation, not an opt-in. Are they targeting the mortgage broker or oil bank? Who is targeting? The government. The Under Castle? In general, in terms of what they're going to litigate against. I don't know so who they're going to litigate against. I have no idea. Other countries? Okay, well, my understanding about other countries, I can't talk, I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on in other countries, but I know specifically, I know generally, the legislations and the regulatory regimes are meant specifically to go after the real spammers and the hackers. That's what they really deal with. Not everybody. We are different. And don't think about other countries, because it doesn't matter. <laughs> what matters is here, right? And right now, here, they're going to go after everybody. So are we the only um, we are one of the few. Yeah. Yeah. How one of the few. I, I can't tell you because I don't know. Frankly, I'll be honest. How I don't know what they're doing. I know what their legislation is, but I can tell you the legislation isn't as sweeping as this. Okay, I don't know how they're actually applying it. I don't know. How are they going to do it here? My understanding is they are just going to go, they're going to, well, they seem to be taking a very black and white approach right now, but we don't know what's going to happen. A what? Yeah, you nail some dude well, a person. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. I got to tell you, though, I, I keep saying, you know, I get, I get a lot of um, denial from people, and they're all like, well, they won't. They, they're not going to go after this Joe Schmo from whatever and, chart, and, and, and find them. Why, why? And then I, and I, my response to them is, why wouldn't they? That's it's kind of like a parking ticket thing. Like, they can take the money. Why wouldn't they? <laughs> they may not go after Joe Schmo for a million dollars, but they have up to a million dollars, right? I don't know how much they're going to charge. I'm just saying, don't assume they're not going to enforce it or, or enforce it because they will. Um, anyway, let me let me go ahead uh, and go through all the exemptions, and then we'll talk about. And I, and I got to tell you, I, it, the response I get is very similar from everybody. Everybody's like, "Oh, it can't be. They won't do it." Well, what what we hear from them is that they will. Um. Okay, so number two, so the other exemption, so first of all, on the personal and family relationship, again, what I'm trying to say is don't assume that you have a personal and family relationship with anyone you send a CM to. That's very, very narrow. Um, second type of exemption that you can rely on, a CM that consists solely of an inquiry or an application. If you're sending an inquiry application to someone, that's fine. Solicited CMs. Okay, so, you know, the idea of the whole, the whole point of this legislation, technically, is to deal with unsolicited CMs. So they say that if you are sending something in response, excuse me, to a request, inquiry, or complaint, or otherwise a solicit or something that's solicited by the other person, um, that's okay. But that's basically consent. You've got consent already, right? So um, internal CM. So there's a there's a uh, particular uh, exemption for let CM sent within an organization or a business um, that concerns the activities of that organization. So what does that mean? You work in a, I, mean, I, do, I know in my office once in a while I get an email, and you guys are charities, so I get an email from a coworker saying, you know, where will you buy this thing we're selling cookies for? 
etc., whatever. But that doesn't have nothing to do with the business that I'm working at right now. It certainly doesn't have to do with my law firm. So that wouldn't be exempt under that exemption because it doesn't deal with my business. All right? Um, this is uh, the business to business exemption is number five. That's something I find a lot of businesses have been relying. It's also an, it's also organization to organization, so it could be a charity charity or uh, not profit to not profit. But um, I don't recommend relying on that exemption. Why? Because what, it's also very narrow. What it says is, you can send a email to someone in another business. You're within your one business. You're sending it to another business. Um, and you have, first of all, an existing relationship. So that could be, doesn't have to be two years, it could be some kind of a relationship. But also, that CM has to concern the activities of the receiver business organization. So you have to, again, send something that has to do with the person on the other end. Similar to the one that I mentioned earlier where I, I published my email account, you can contact me, but it has to do with whatever I'm, my business is. So you can contact that business with, whom, with which you have a relationship or that organization with which you have a relationship, like a supplier, send them an email, as long as it has to do with their actual business. Um, CM to enforce a legal right, that's something that I'm going to be relying a lot on. Um, you're sending an email demanding money because they owe you, that kind of stuff, that's fine. Um, okay, so number seven is kind of what you sort of mentioned, someone mentioned here earlier about sending something within LinkedIn or Facebook. Uh, it's... This exemption is very strict. Again, these are words used by the regulation. No one really understands what they mean. My interpretation and sort of what I'm get we're getting from CRTC is that they kind of meant to it to be relied on a um, closed communication within a sort of something you sign into. Okay. So, for example, I would say uh, within social media. Uh, so it's CM sent within an electronic platform. That's the word they use where unsubscribe and identifying information is conspicuously published and readily available. So I said, e.g., within a social network. The person that you're contacting, is, uh, is in order to be able to contact them, they have actually signed it. They, and, they've, and, and as part of the sign-in, it says you can always unsubscribe, etc. You can, you know, here's the identifying information. So if you kind of contact that person within, so send send a message within Facebook, that kind of stuff. I believe that would be okay under that exemption. That's my interpretation. <laughs> um, and that's, and I think they're going to, because, and the reason I say that is because the CRTC and the Industry Canada, after the act has come into play, were inundated with questions about social media, social media, and they keep saying, oh, no, no, social media is exempt, social media is exempt. Well, where is it exempt? So I think that's what they mean. And I say I think because they never actually said it yet now. And I mean, when I say yet is because they, they're telling us that they're going to be uh, publishing more information or more guidelines. Um, but... Uh, I'm, I'm anticipating that they're going to say that that exemption applies to communication within a social media platform. Okay. Uh, number eight is CM sent within a limited access secure account by the person who provides the account. This is a pure. This is what they call is the ba banking exemption. This is when you uh, have a bank. You know, you sign into your banking portal. Your bank can communicate with you directly within that portal. That's fine. Okay. Uh, but that's only for the banks. CM sent by a political party. Uh, for the primary purpose of soliciting contributions, kind of similar to the charity's primary purpose then. Uh, CM sent to a foreign jurisdiction. So here's, but here's the kicker. So you can send emails to someone outside of Canada, all right? But then Castle says you have to comply with the anti-spam legislation in that jurisdiction. And if you don't comply with anti-spam legislation in whatever jurisdiction you're sending it to, then CRTC can go after you here. Okay. By their rules. By their rules, yeah. No, not by their rules, but they, you, oh. you are, you are in, that, in that sense, you're violating Castle. You're violating Canadian law by violating foreign law, which is very unusual. And, and I, I do a lot of cross-border jurisdictional legal issues. That's really unusual. So you have to be uh, familiar. If you know you're sending emails to the U.S., you have to be familiar with the U.S. legislation on anti-spam. You have to make sure you comply. So all these companies that outsource their email platforms to people in India, Poland, wherever they may be, that possible, it's it, you know. Interesting. <laughs> the internet is it has no boundaries, right? So you know, you're you're sending emails, you're sending emails all over the world. Uh, you got to make sure you comply with those legis that that uh, legislation. I'm laughing because it's so burdensome for especially uh, in the in the business the community, right? Laughing. In the business community, it's just so it's beyond burdensome. Um, doesn't apply to two-way voice communication, so you can talk to someone on the phone. <laughs> 
Um, and faxes are okay, as I'm sure most people send faxes these days. And voicemail messages are okay. So they said specifically robocalls are fine. <laughs> so you can still get those messages saying that you want a trip to the Bahamas. That's okay. But an email that says you want a trip to the Bahamas, that's not okay. Okay. And those are exemptions that they included in there because apparently it wasn't clear in the act. And it wasn't. The, the act was <laughs> appeared to include those as well. So, anyway. May I ask, what, what if you're a, a Canadian person or corporation that's sending your messages into Canada from outside? Same. The act applies, so a castle applies to any electronic messages that are accessed by a Canadian in Canada or by a, computer, a Canadian computer. So this castle applies to foreign uh, entities as well. If the, anyone who sends emails to Canada, that applies, that, that catches them. So you can't be a Canadian sending from, having someone send it from outside, doesn't matter. As long as it's accessed in Canada, a castle applies. All right, so the exemptions I just mentioned, the list of exemptions applies, to what, what, what basically, if, if if your CM falls into any one of that, those exemptions, those very specific ones, the personal, family, the charities, what does that mean? It means you don't have to worry about the CASEL requirements. You don't have to get consent. You don't have to include the unsubscribe. You don't have to include the information. You're good. Okay, you can just set it as long as it falls under the, one of those exemptions. Okay. There is another section to the Act that says um, if it falls under these six listed exemptions, which I'll sort of briefly talk about, then... Uh, you don't have to get consent, but you still have to have the information and the unsubscribe. Okay? So you don't have to get consent, but still has to have the unsubscribe, and you have to implement the unsubscribe for these situations. The first one is a third-party referral one. So it's what it's <laughs> very unusual as well. What it says is someone gives you my email account, or my email you know, says, oh, you should contact Mani because she's a great, you know, she'll be a great donor, right? Um, you know, she's very interested in, 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 your, in, in, in whatever your organization does. Uh, and that person happens to know me, and they have my consent already to contact them, right? That person I have a relationship with. So then you can send me an email, one email, one CM, okay? Only one. Saying, hi, I'm so-and-so. Uh, Miss, you know, Ms. X gave me your contact information. She referred me to you. I think you'd be interested in what my organization does or giving some money, blah, 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 etc. That's okay. One email. You can't do any more beyond that unless you get my consent. Uh, and you have to include the unsubscribe and the information requirements. And if I don't respond, you can't follow up. Okay. Unless you got consent but in I different directions. You, you can call me, yeah. You can call me and get consent by phone. <laughs> Anytime. You can call me in the middle of the night, apparently. Not a problem. Don't call me in the middle of the night. But yeah, no, that that's you can do that. You can get consent in other ways, but you have consent. You don't need to get consent to contact me for the first time if you have a referral. That's the first thing it says. Um, you don't need to consent for to provide a quote or estimate in response to a request. Obviously, if I sent you an email and said, "Oh, uh, you know, could you uh, tell me how much it's going to cost to do why?" You can call me. You can contact me back. But you still have to include the unsubscribe, and you still have to include the information in the in the email. Warranty, recall, and product safety information. Frankly, I don't understand why that's there at all. Um, it's not, um, in my, you know, most lawyers will tell you, and I uh, that deal with this, we've all agree that emails that provide information for, you know, warranty information, recall, or safety under the legislation that are basically required are not CMs in any event because they're not promoting commercial activity. They wouldn't fall under. The only reason I think they included that as an exemption is what happens if companies do that. They send an email saying, here's a recall, and by the way, buy this. Okay, that turns it into a CM, and so they're saying, that's okay, you can send that, because you have to still send the warranty, but you have to include the information and unsubscribe, okay? Um, so a CM that delivers a product, you're delivering a product, delivering a service, that's okay. Uh, again, you have to include the information and unsubscribe. Uh, CMs that facilitate or confirm transactions. I'm a lawyer I'm all the time. I constantly send emails saying, I'm just confirming, we had this discussion, you gave me these instructions, that kind of stuff, that's okay. Um, CMs that provide factual information. So you're just, remember in the beginning I said, I don't believe a CM is something that's purely factual. Okay. Uh, and it's not a CM in any event, so I don't know why it's under the exemption rules, but in any event it's there. Um, I've highlighted CMs that provide factual information about ongoing subscription and membership. That's the kind of thing that I would 
presume you, the nonprofits will do, charities will give you information. Um, that's okay. Uh, you're providing information about your ongoing purchases, employment relations, benefit plans. That's all okay, as long as you include the information in the unsubscribes. Okay. Okay, so. It's a lot of information to take in, I know, looking at the time. I think okay. now would be a good chance for like a five-minute break because yeah. it starts with legs. Yes. It's initially cooler when you go down like before, four steps. Before we do that, I just want to show you one thing. I've given you a flashlight. I'm almost done because and before we'll take a break, we'll take a break and then Jim will go. But to help everybody, what I have done is I have gone and prepared a bit of a flow chart because it's a lot of information to take in and you can sort of follow that when you go home and ponder this. Um, or to your office. So what ha you know, you're a charity or nonprofit and you want to figure out what we need to do before July 1st. Okay. The first thing you got to do is you have to ask yourself the question, do you, do I send CMs? That's the first question everybody has to ask. <laughs> if the answer is no, and I've written unlikely, because almost <laughs> everybody sends CMs, the answer is no. You don't have to worry about Castle. You're done. You're good. Right? <laughs> unlikely. The answer is yes, most likely. Then the next question you should ask yourself is, am I a registered charity? Okay. If the answer is yes, you may be exempt from complying with CASEL if the primary purpose of the CM that you're sending is to raise funds for the charity. Okay, those, those, all those CMs are exempt. You don't have to worry about CASEL. If you're not a registered charity or you're unsure, but when I say unsure, I don't mean that you're unsure whether you're a registered charity, but you're unsure whether it's, a, it's, a, it's for the primary purpose of raising funds, and you have to ask yourself, do one of the other exemptions apply? Okay, so um, is it an organization to organization that I talked about where it has to do with the organization's business? Is it a personal family <coughs> relationship, internal CMs? I've given you a quick list of what we talked about. That's a, that's a very small. Um, if you, oh, sorry, if yes, if any of the exemptions apply, then you don't have to worry about it, you're done. If no or you're not sure if one of the exemptions apply to the CMs, um, then you have to ask yourself one of these. Is the CM a third-party referral? And I've given you a list of what you can ask yourself. If the answer to that is yes, then you don't have to get consent to send it. You can, you can send it, but you have to make sure that you, can, you include the information and the unsubscribe. Okay. If the answer to all these exemptions is no, I, they don't apply to my CM or one CM that I'm sending out, then you got to ask yourself the next question: Is consent implied? Can I rely on implied consent? Okay, do I need to, or do I have to get actual real consent, like express consent? Um, and so the question: It would be implied if you're a registered charity <coughs> or a nonprofit, and the recipient of that CM has been your volunteer donor member for the past two years. Then you have implied consent. You can send that CM. You're good. Still have to include the information and unsubscribe, but you can send it. So the answer to that is yes, as I mentioned. Implied consent is good for two years, okay? So you can send that CM for two years after they've donated, joined as a member, or volunteered. After those two years, you have to get express consent, okay? Or again, the answer is, I'm not sure if I have implied consent, or no, I don't. Well then, before July 1st, <laughs> so soon, you got to get express consent from the person you're sending those CMs to. They have to consent to those CMs, or you can send them. Um, and you have to include the unsubscribe and the information after July 1st. Remember I said how, how I said that you can't just send a CM asking for express consent after July 1st? You have to get express consent in other ways. Okay. So you have to do it um, in paper form. You can do it by, like, on the phone. Um, you can do it as part of something else, like you're getting into, you're, someone is donating, you get consent on the spot, that kind of stuff. Um, and you have to include the prescribed information and the unsubscribe, and you have to make sure you implement them. Okay? Okay, so why, why don't we take a quick break, and uh, we'll take a break, and I'll just give you the quick tips. We're already <laughs> at one hour, aren't we? Okay, so now that I've sort of given you what you need to know about what the CM is all about. I'm going to take you, we're running out of time, very quickly through a few tips that I put together for you to think about stuff to do to prepare. Um, of course, we're always help. There's way more that you can do, and I'm happy to talk to you about it later, but just very quickly we'll go through that, and then I'm going to 
hand it over to Jim. I'll, and I'll talk about the computer programs first as well, but very quickly. So, um, tips for, for preparing for Castle's CM requirements, okay? Very briefly, first of all, conduct an audit, right? Do an audit. What does that mean? Ask yourself, does your organization send CMs? Is con do you need to get consent? Is consent, do you have implied consent? What form of, of express consent do you plan on obtaining? Um, do you need to include prescribed information in CM? These are kind of things that you need to ask yourself as you're doing your audit. Okay. Um, the answer to the first question, do you send CMs, is most likely yes, as I mentioned. Um, so when you do go through the audit about CMs, these are all sort of questions that you need to consider. What forms of electronic communications does the organization use to communicate with internal and external parties? On behalf of which entities does it, does it uh, send electronic communications? The reason I say that is because if you're sending stuff on behalf of another, comp uh, another organization, you have to make sure that you're complying on their own behalf as well. Who is sending, um, what organizations or companies or businesses or people are sending CNs on your behalf? You have to make sure they comply. Um, what type of, what, what, does, what do these communications contain? What information is in it? Uh, what is the purpose of sending them? That's a very important question to ask yourself when you do your audit. Um, is consent required? Another question to ask yourself. Um, Nonprofit organizations, most likely yes for your, all your CMs because you don't have a particular general exemption like the charities do. Charities, you don't need to get it, as I mentioned, if the primary purpose is to raise funds. Recommended option, my suggestion, or take and said, for all your CMs and then don't worry about it. Um, is consent implied? I mentioned earlier the two year implied consent for charities, nonprofits, with respect to donors, volunteers, and members. Beyond two years, no more implied consent. So what I suggest to do is, if you're going to rely on that, keep track. Have what I call a tickling, uh, tickler system. Jim will talk about that a little more. What does that mean? Six months before, reminder, it's coming up, it's coming up. I've got to do something about it. I've got to get express consent. Forms of express consent. Figure out how you want to get express consent. So you make, and make sure that it complies with the requirements. Some examples are paper form electronic, but not in the form of a CM, and no pre-check box. I mentioned that earlier. Um, it, it has to say specifically and clearly what that you're seeking, what purpose you're seeking it for. So you can't just say, I'm seeking it for the purpose of collecting your personal information. No, it has to say, I'm seeking it for the purpose of sending you newsletters, electronic messages, whatever it is that you, you send, okay? Um, prescribed information requirements. Again, if the charity's exemption applies, you don't need to include it. All others, ensure that your electronic communications contain the prescribed information, ensure that you contain the unsubscribe, ensure that you imp implement the unsubscribe. Uh, tip number two, develop and implement CASEL compliance policies and procedures. Very important. Why do I say that? Well, the Act provides you with what is called a due diligence defense. If an email is sent out that is not in compliance with the CASEL, someone goes to the CRTC, that website, files a complaint against you, they come to you and say, hey, what's going on? Someone's complained. You can then come to the CRTC and say, well, you call me. <laughs> and I will say, I'm just kidding. But the, your lawyer will call and talk to the CRTC and say, hey, we have implemented policies and procedures to comply with CASEL. Here's all the rules that we have for our employees, for our staff, for our management. Um, this was just a one-off thing. Okay, we've done, we've done our due diligence. We have done what we can to make sure we comply. If you can show that, then you have a complete defense to Castle. In other words, you can avoid liability. Okay, that's and in fact, that is the only defense to Castle. It's not enough that you can. It's not a defense to say I didn't know. Well, I didn't know I was. I didn't know I was a CM. I didn't know I was not complying. I didn't know. No. What the defense is? I knew that I, I have to comply. I've done what I can to comply. This was something that was unexpected. Okay, I thought of what I could do. Um, compliance policies. So those type of things you have to think about and develop, and it's similar to privacy policies. Okay, and the same idea, that same way of you of implementing private privacy policies. Um, you have to figure out ways of requesting, maintaining, and implementing consents, keeping track, implementing unsubscribes, develop and implement Castle compliant language. You got to have certain uh, language that complies with Castle in your contracts. Just as an example, on your website, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, training and education very important. Okay. You got to go up top, to the end, to the top, the people that make the decisions, because they're the ones, 
because any decision regarding CASEL compliance has to be made um, with a risk consideration, and there has to be risk management impl implications to it, and again, the people up top have to be involved in this, in this decision making. So, first of all, if you're not the, decide the person who makes the decisions on behalf of the organization, train and educate those people, because they need to know about it. Um, and train and educate management, employees, volunteers, anyone who is sending electronic communications on your behalf. Make sure they know what CASEL is about. Um, develop a training program for your employees and your staff, your volunteers, new hires, etc. Uh, consider training third parties that are sending CMs on your behalf as well. Okay. Um, review your contract with third parties. Remember I mentioned, excuse me, earlier that if someone sends a CM on your behalf, another organization, you may be liable. So what I recommend is first of all, within the contracts with that third party, like a marketing or advertising company, for example, um, have a CASEL compliance requirement. Require them to comply with CASEL and also have what I would say in, I call an indemnification provision, which is you know, us lawyers basically use the legal, legal language to say, if you don't comply and I get dinged, you indemnify me. Okay. Um, consider buying insurance for CASEL. I'm not an insurance broker, but I'm sure they're out there developing insurance for this right now. Okay, so think about it. Um, okay, two more minutes for other CASEL requirements. I mentioned that in addition to CM, there's other requirements. The main requirement that you need to be aware of as of January 1st, well, I, I made the list of all the other requirements, the installation of computer programs, unauthorized electronic collection of personal information, email address harvesting. Do you, do you know what email address harvesting is? That's a program, a computer program, code that goes out there and collects email addresses. Google does it all the time, um, obviously, and and then targets that, right? You, they, you don't know that your email's out there, you buy something, and next thing you know, you get emails on selling, trying to give you similar products that would be related. That's email address harvesting. There's code that's reading your email. Um, prohibition against misleading marketing, okay? So the computer programs is what I want to talk about for the two minutes. Um, as of January 1st, 2015, it is prohibited to install a computer program, such as a software, an application, an app, on a computer or device, such as a phone, tablet, etc., in Canada, unless express consent is provided by the owner of that computer or tablet for that installation. So, that also applies to upgrades and updates to your computer program. Um, there's some express consent is assumed in certain circumstances. I'm not going to get into that. But the reason I think this is relevant to some of you is if you have an app, that needs that that applies. Okay, you have to get express consent to the installation and upgrade of the app. Um, does your organization provide services through a computer program, for example? Uh, does your organization provide a program for its employees to contact each other um, through like remote access, for example? Okay, um, those are the kind of things that if you're not in the IT business, this is the stuff you have to think about. Um, if the answer is yes, you must seek consent for the installation, upgrade, and update. And you have to explain what it's for. They, the person who's, done, doing, who's installing it has to understand that they're installing it. Okay. There's also particular requirements regarding specific functions. So, for example, if your program collects personal information, interferes with the owner's ability to control their device, changes settings or preferences without the owner's knowledge, interferes with data, preventing the owner from accessing it, causes a device to communicate with another, or installs any software that can be activated remotely, like the remote access that I was mentioning earlier for employees. Um, if, that, if it meets any of those criteria, you have to explain to the person who owns that device that it's doing that. They have to understand, and you have to do it in very clear and simple language, you know, not in, not in computer legally, it's like a computer language. So, so it has to be very simple. The person has to understand that the program is doing this, okay? But is this only for things that are downloaded onto someone? It's not just downloads. It's, it's anything, any installations, any code that goes on the computer, any code. It doesn't right, have to be computer, specific download. It's not like an online system that someone... Yeah, yeah. Into. No, if it's online and it's, it's installing something on the person's computer, then it will apply. <laughs> it, it really depends. It's very IT specific, okay? Um, electronic collection and use of personal information address harvesting. Again, CASEL prohibits anyone from using electronic system to collect or use your personal information <coughs> or to or get your email addresses, okay, um, without the person's consent. 
So you have to review your marketing strategy, particularly if you have out outside marketers. You know, tr um, uh, tracking people's you know usage online and and uh, targeting them. That's captured under this. Uh, and uh, if that's the case, then I would recommend either com just completely eliminate the practice or get consent. Okay. Okay. So I'm very briefly referred to what how we being myself and MethodWorks will talk about as well what they can do, but myself as a lawyer who practices and is what some stuff that we do, um, we can help you with the audits, we can help you with the drafting of the policies, we can help you with the drafting of the third party contracts, we can uh, we do compliance training for your employees and your management, and as well we're gonna we'll help you when you get a call from the CRTC or from <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So I'm not going to take questions right now. I'm going to go on to Jim because there's no time. But I put my email there for any questions. Please feel free to email me. I also forgot to put my Twitter, uh, my Twitter feed, but Twitter, it's my full name. So, you know, hashtag Manny Demo. I will be posting updates as they come about. So you're welcome to follow me and I'll help you out. Right. I'm on, on to Jim. Thank you for round one. Thank you. Woo.